I now have the great honor um, uh, to introduce the next two speakers. Uh, we're going to hear from Teresa Schotz first. Um, she's the daughter of Russell Maroon Schotz, who's been in solitary confinement for more than 20 years um, and has been, a, you know, a stalwart, stalwart in the fight um, for his being out of being released from solitary and against injustice in the present day prison system. And she said, realizing that our youth are the potential victims of the prison system, she has really spent a lot of her time in after school uh, programs for youth. And she herself has taken in 11 kids through the foster care system. Um, I can't remember if I met Teresa or Maroon first, but you know, like father, like daughter, they are two fighters and I'm really honored to have them here. Thank you, and um, I'd like to thank um, everyone for coming out this morning. I can tell you, as um, Phoebe described, um, it, you know, it, I won't just say it's in my blood, but my father being the fighter that he has been, not only for injustice, uh, when he started um, before being incarcerated um, in the black communities, he and others, such as the BLA and uh, the Black Panther Party, and uh, my dad started the Black Unity Council here in Philadelphia, were standing on the front lines for poor people and just people in the black community who were being confronted by vicious uh, police um, under the Philadelphia Police Department, under Frank Rizzo, whichever route you want to go with it. And not only did my father and the organizations that he was a part of discover that these people really needed their help, the community demanded that the Panthers and folks like my dad step out there and protect us. There was a 16-year-old youth who was gunned down in his kitchen in the 70s in front of his mother. And Frank Rizzo and his um, police officers stomped through the community and, and they would uh, um, step over one person, knock them to the side and say, oh, wrong nigga. And um, the community demanded that if the Panthers were going to be there for them with the breakfast programs and the other programs that they provided, that they also step up and protect the community. So that's where my dad fell in in reference to protecting the community and it was like war being raged against the Black Panthers against the um, police force that was here in Philadelphia. So when people think of the Panthers, they, they look at uh, these um, black men and women who were holding guns and dressed in all black. But uh, more than that, it became that position where they had to protect themselves against what was happening. And so, um, I, I just came off a wonderful book tour where my father has just written a book called Maroon the Implacable. And we kind of debated over that name, the Implacable, would people really get it? And he said, hey, listen, I've been in solitary confinement almost 30 years. I am the Implacable. <laughs> you know, I have withstood what I have seen around me with young folks now who are being incarcerated who cannot stand, withstand solitary confinement, sometime within the first hour, they take their lives. So, our, one of our missions became to um, be a voice for the young folks, not only the folks who have been in solitary for a long period of time, because our revolutionary prisoners, our political prisoners, for some reason, um, but not for some reason, it's just their makeup. They, they are able to withstand this solitary confinement. Not that it's right at all. But what they're seeing is that these young folks, my dad always say they come in strolling, and once they get in the solitary confinement, they're walking like zombies. Within six months, they've been medicated. Um, they've been given all kind of uh, medicines that controls the voice. 
this is how I, I, I really look at it when I see some of these guys behind glass during our visit. It came to me that in the 70s, there were uprisings. The Attica uprising and prisoners was fighting against injustice then. Um, as Bonnie announced earlier, people are still being gunned down by the cops. And the prison system is the same as it was years ago with their, their abuse. They've just taken it to another level. But those voices of those prisoners with the Attica rebellion, they have quieted those voices with solitary confinement. Now, if you're a jailhouse lawyer, if you protest against this solitary confinement or any injustice behind the walls in prison now, you're placed in solitary confinement. And then you're quiet. You don't have a voice anymore. And this has become the norm. When visiting all the universities that we visit to on the tour, I would ask the youth in the audience, the college student, do you have anyone in prison and they, or a loved one? No. And I would say, well, one of you may wind up in prison. And they were, oh, lady, you're wrong. You're so wrong. You're in a university right now. <laughs> My parents brought me here to get me away from it. And I said, well, let's think about this solitary confinement that you'll be in, an uh, economic solitary confinement because with the rate of this uh, incarceration and the jobs being focused in the prison area and you not being able to pay back your solid, your your uh, student loans think about that economic solitary confinement when you're in a room like a cell by yourself and the phone is ringing off the hook because you can't pay back your student loans that's a solitary economic confinement. And then they open their minds to what I'm talking about. Because as the women who are the background or of our communities, as Phoebe said, the aunts, the daughters, um, the women, we are the background of any injustice in our communities, as Patrice here knows. Uh, we've been fighting on the front line. Even during the Panther Day, the women were in the back. But they were making the job happen, and they were the ground base for uh, these breakfast programs and the education program. And so what I did was, why I got so involved with my dad, because my dad went to jail, I'm 49. He was in jail by the time I was nine years old. So he's been in there 40 years. So I looked at the prison system as a nice place to go. Because when I was going 40 years ago, they had um, little reading rooms. You could open a book. They would read to you. You could go on the playground. We would have big um, cookouts there. Prisoners were allowed to take college courses. So we seen these educated men who went in as this person, but would come out college educated. But you know, those, those programs had disappeared. But what happened with most of those people that I know, all of them that I know who received college degrees back some 40 years ago, have never returned to prison. Never. Some of them are working in the prison system now. But with that funding being cut, because the prison knows what makes money and what doesn't. And when you educate a prisoner, he may not come back. Right. So those programs have been eliminated. The same way uh, where our governor, I have worked with a group, the Carcerate PA, who's fighting against the expansion of new prison. We're fighting now for $50 million for our public school system. <laughs> When the governor's going to use 600 something million dollars to expand SEI Greaterford and build SEI Phoenix, something's wrong with that picture. So my fight became for my dad because I thought the prison was a nice place. When he called, now we're speeding up 20 years or so, he said, I'm not getting medical, my prostate, something's going wrong. I said, oh, they'll take care. He said, no, no, you got to get up here. And I'm like, what is he talking about? And it took more calls from my dad pleading 
and I said, something's wrong here. He said, now it's my eye. I'm almost 70. I need a cataract. They're not going to give it to me. And when I called the medical department, they said, no, he gets one eye. I said, wait a minute. Hold up. One eye. What do you mean? And so before, I said, I got to get to this medical department. And you know the medical department in our Pennsylvania prison system, whoever the agency that the prison select or state prison is the bit at the lowest, the cheapest bed. Now you know with some of us out here outside the prison system with no medical, you think they're going to give a prisoner medical attention? So I had to investigate this chief of staff who is head of the um, doctors in every prison. I looked up where his kids went to school. I had his background, his church he attended, and then I got on the Amtrak train the next morning when he told me one eye. I had to see that in writing. So he said, what the hell are you doing here? I told you one eye. I said, well, I need to see that in your medical directives, you know. And it was there. A prisoner, he can go blind. My dad didn't have to get the cataract surgery until he was 2100 where you're blind. What will it do then? And I said, well, wait a minute. What your daughter? What about your daughter down there in Penn Valley School? He said, what is my daughter? How do you know about her school? I said, well, she's a cheerleader. Post, she fall and break her arm. <laughs> what about your son on the football team two miles away from me? He gets hit in the eye. Does he get one eye? So don't tell me. So with that kind of fight that I've had in my sphere for my dad, um, we have gotten every medical. He called me outside. I get emotional because when he was crying for attention, he called me when I said, I got a heart monitor in my cell. They put the, I was like, what? He was just laughing, laughing. Where the last call was, I'm scared for my life. You know, and we got everything that we needed. So you can get whatever you want. We are the people and we have power like no other power. Don't depend on your legislators. Because back in the 60s, the legislators worked with the people. They're not working with us now. And so you have to go out and fight on your own. I went to California doing this hunger strike. And I was so amazed with these prisoners who not only came together to say, we're not going for this, this abuse anymore, uh, being confined like this. Uh, we did the strike two years ago. You didn't acknowledge any of those issues. Uh, the um, uh, Brown, the governor there, um, they kind of met to the table two years ago with the prisoner and made promises. And they didn't carry them out. But when you see prisoners come together, and this is what I mean where you have to stand up and help these people behind bars. When you see prisoners come together and say, we will no longer fight each other. We're going to stop work stoppage. We're not going to make the prison any more money. And we're not going to fight. This gang thing is going to stop right now. We're going to show them you must take a stand and back these prisoners up. So with that, I, I just want to say that um, hey, this couldn't have been done had my dad, like the California prisoners, my dad and other prisoners came together and said, we're going to start HRC, the Human Rights Coalition Group of Philadelphia. We're going to get 10,000 family members involved because legislation wasn't listening to me until I pound on their doors, pound, go to the, I would go to the medical, I would go to the governor. But 10,000 people can change a vote. So if we had... We have 2 million people in prison. Why can't we get 10,000 family members together in each state and make these legislators listen? So out of HRC, the Human Rights Coalition Group, I have loved ones here now that I've been working with for like 10 years, family members, Patricia Vickers, um, Karen Ali is here, and Matt is here, who we are making a difference. We're small. We're not 10,000. But the prison knows us very well. 
I went to the first congressional hearing in Washington on solitary confinement. They finally had a hearing on it last year. It was the most attended hearing. They had to open up additional rooms because people are so concerned about what's going on. And the testimonies were just brutal how people had been treated. And uh, the, uh, the federal district attorney came to me and said, why do you have on that orange prison jumpsuit? And when I explained to him what was going on, he said, oh, we've been visiting your website. This is the Federal Justice Department. Been going to HRC websites because we document the allegations of abuse. We put the time of abuse, the, the guard's name. And had it not been for family members like Patricia Vicker, HRC, Karen Ali, people documenting all these letters, we get... HRC gets hundreds of letters a month, prisoners begging for help. We don't have the type of uh, staff to address all these, but when you see all these letters, you know that this system is corrupt. So I want to thank you. My time is up. I'm so passionate about it. I could tell you more.